In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today on this Feast of the Holy Family, I would like to explain to you why we have the many social and uh, political and other problems that affect the family today. There were three revolutions which have taken place. There have been three revolutions which have brought the world into the miserable state in which we find it. The first was the French Revolution, which began in 1789. Although it is viewed as principally a political revolution, in fact, at bottom, it was a revolution against the establishment of the Catholic Church as the religion of the state. From the time of Clovis, who lived from 466 to 511, the French nation had received Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church as its faith and religious authority. The French state publicly professed the Catholic faith and, at least in principle, made the Catholic faith the law of the land. Such a state of affairs constitutes the supreme order of a nation. For no matter what other problems the nation may have, if it possesses this attachment to Christ the King and, by, and, and to his church, it is an essentially ordered nation. Conversely, if it repudiates this order, no matter what can be said for in its favor, it is an essentially disordered nation and it is headed toward moral ruin. The disorder is especially acute if the nation had at one time received the Catholic faith and subsequently repudiated it. Such a nation is not merely pagan, it is an apostate nation. Albert Camus, who lived from 1913 to 1960, the well-known French atheist, communist, and existentialist, who said, the absurd is the essential concept and first truth. He stated, that the beheading of Louis XVI in 1793 marked the end of the role of God in history. How very true. Indeed, when we look at the history of the 19th century, the changes wrought by the French Revolution were principally religious. Nearly every once Catholic society in Europe and in Latin America, through the agitation of Freemasons and other enemies of the Church, banished the influence of the Catholic Church and declared themselves purely secularistic. The French Revolution injected liberalism into the veins of Catholic Europe, deifying human liberty to the point of being a goddess. And that's why they made for us the Statue of Liberty, a goddess of liberty. Liberalism's first principle is that the individual is by nature free from any constraint outside of himself and can be constrained only if he should agree to it. But this liberalism brings with it socialism as its logical consequence because it is obvious that human beings must be constrained in certain ways so that they don't murder each other and they don't steal from each other. So what happens is that the general will of the populace must prevail as the way in which to constrain liberty. And from this, a democratic or populist socialism flowed directly. The second great revolution, therefore, was that of 1917, 
Socialism as a system was born among the radical Protestants in the 16th century. It surfaced again during the French Revolution and in the, and the 19th century witnessed the gradual rise of this political and social wickedness. As the Industrial Revolution made its impact on European and American society, the downtrodden workers, and indeed downtrodden they were, stripped as they were of religion in their political worlds, looked to the dreamy and heady promises of socialism as the solution to their problems. As time wore on, the vestiges of the old order political systems still functioning in Europe, such as the Kaiser's Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire, were being interiorly corroded by the rise of socialism. No country was exempt from this disease, but it was these countries which put up a significant fight against it. England and France, for their part, went down the socialist tubes with no trouble at all. Nor was America exempt from this agitation. Karl Marx was a correspondent for the New York Herald during the 19th century. And most of the labor movements of the late 19th century and the early 20th century were deeply infected by socialism and communism. In November of 1917, the socialist hell broke out loose in St. Petersburg, Russia. Already the moderate socialists under the Freemason Kerensky had deposed the Tsar. But like all moderate movements, the, the Kerensky government eventually gave way to the logic of its own system and Russia was transformed from what was then the most traditional society into the most radical. It had been the most traditional since it operated on the theory that the Tsar was the, was the ultimate authority in the land and the father of his people. The Russian schismatic church was intimately tied to the state. <clears throat> But overnight, Russia turned into a radically democratic, in theory, society which espoused atheism as its official religion. In fact, the communist leaders would turn out to be more autocratic than their czarist predecessors, <clears throat> predecessors and far more oppressive. Stalin killed an estimated 30 million of his own people in order to achieve his political ends. The state became the new god for the socialists, and the individual, if he threatened the state in any way, had to be eliminated. This 1917 Russian Revolution, however, caught fire in every land of the earth, practically, and can still be felt to this day. Ironically, we see political leaders presenting themselves to be president of the United States who espouse socialism and even communism. Even though in the 1950s, communism was considered the arch enemy of the United States of America. And the very word communist was a dirty word. And now it's being paraded around as if it is something normal and natural and desirable. <clears throat> Germany, after World War I, was rotted out from the inside by socialists who urged the mutiny of the army and the navy, which in turn was the principal reason for Germany's capitulation in 1918, because the army and the navy were infected with socialism. A study of all of the European nations 
and of the United States starting in the year 1918 reveals a startling shift to socialism and even communism. In 1914, before World War I, there still reigned a political order and social order which, although imperfect in many ways, respected at least the natural forms of justice and natural law. But in 1918, it is as if the world <clears throat> went completely crazy, both politically and socially. We have not recovered to this day from the blow of World War I and its aftermath. The treaties of Versailles and of Paris in 1919 mark the creation of a secularistic and socialistic world order as well as the call to universal democracy as the only acceptable form of government. Any other form of government was considered to be, by its very nature, oppressive of human rights. This mania for democracy, which all of the philosophers, including Plato and Aristotle, considered the worst of all governments, this mania for democracy comes straight out of the pages of the socialist textbook. <coughs> it was this power to the people movement which gave rise to the socialist dictatorships of the 1920s and the 1930s. The political and social insanity of socialism quickly gained ground in Europe and when wed to nationalism, it produced a Nazism, the Nazism of Germany and the Italian fascism. Even those countries such as the United States, England and France, which did not fall either under Nazism or fascism, nevertheless succumbed to the programs of socialism. We immediately think of Franklin D. Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor, who both had deep connections to socialists and communists in this country and abroad, and who enacted many socialist reforms in America and in a 12-year reign managed to completely transform the American political and social mind into one of socialism <coughs> and big government. It should be recalled that Roosevelt had a great admiration for Stalin <clears throat> and called him Uncle Joe and for Stalinist Russia and even instructed Hollywood to make films during World War II to show that the Russian system <clears throat> of communism was something noble and enjoyable. For there were not a few Americans asking why we were fighting one ruthless dictator, Hitler, on, on the side of another ruthless dictator, Stalin, who was perhaps even worse. <clears throat> so by 1960, the effects of the two revolutions could be clearly seen, the effects of the 1789 revolution by the absence of religion in society, <clears throat> society which had become entirely secularistic, and the effects of 1917 whereby the world was soaked in the mentality of socialism with the aban abandonment of at least naturally sound principles and uh, uh, naturally sound political and social principles. So by 1960, it was, the time, it was the time for the third revolution, which was the worst of them. The revolution which will overturn both religion and morality in the individual and in the family. In 1960, although society was already secularized by the, the 1789 revolution and socialized by the 1917 revolution, Nevertheless for, the, nevertheless, for the most part, individuals and families still remained immune from these influences. 
the family was still ordered. The Catholic faith could still be found in the local parishes. <clears throat> the Catholic schools flourished. Even among non-Catholics, there prevailed a certain common decency and morality. Divorce, although permitted by Protestants, was still considered shameful. In this family unit, the father was the head of the house and the source of discipline. In most cases, only he went to work outside the home. And the mother stayed home and cared for the children, kept the house clean, did the shopping, and made dinner. The family lived on the single income of the father since it was unthinkable that the mother should be outside of the home when the children are there. In most cases, there was only one family car. Travel was rather limited. People did not drive the distances they do today. This stability helped to keep the family together, enjoying a truly common life. In short, the devastating wave of religious, political, and social sickness had not yet penetrated the home. It was still, for the most part, intact. Catholics were able, were able to carve out for themselves a, a Catholic world by a network of schools, activities, friends, associations, in such a way that they seldom had any serious contact with non-Catholics, except perhaps in business. The Catholic faith ensconced in so many Catholic parishes, uh, in, in the many Catholic parishes that dotted the land, seemed as solid as a rock, imperturbable, absolutely unchanging, as it was unchangeable. It seemed that the, that the least of your worries in life was the condition of the Catholic Church. By 1970, one decade, this idyllic family life, heretofore immune from the religious, social, and political upheavals of the 1789 and 1917 revolutions, completely fell apart. Anyone who lived through the 1960s knows what I am talking about. It is as if the gates of hell were opened and the devils poured out in numbers as never before. First, there was the sexual revolution. Certainly, the seeds of this perversion were clearly present already from the 1920s. Hollywood destroyed women by making them into mere objects of lust. Hardly ever did Hollywood produce a movie in which a woman ha had a purpose other than being attractive to men. Decades of such films had a slow but devastating effect upon women, their habits and their fashions. Everyone wanted to be the glamour girl, the movie star, and dress and act in the way those characters did. Then, in 1962, the greatest of all events since the crucifixion took place, the, and that is the modernist revolution in the Catholic Church. In a matter of less than one decade, the glorious superstructure of truth that the Catholic Church had been became reduced to handfuls of people who are struggling to survive and to re retain their Catholic identity. The entire edifice of Catholic, prime, of, of <clears throat> Catholic institutions collapsed, where not a single parish, seminary, school, convent, 
could be found which was not imbued with the venom of modernism. The natural effect of this revolution was the utter destruction of the Catholic faith in hundreds of millions of souls. In the place of unchanging dogmas and absolute moral principles, a new relativism was inserted. Overnight, everything changed from clear black and white into a misty and foggy gray. The 1960s also produced the birth control pill and women's liberation. These two factors would have a fatal effect upon family life. Before the 1960s <clears throat> and the pill, birth control was considered something reprehensible by ordinary people, even non Catholics only radical left-wingers in the 1920s and the 1930s promoted birth control. Before the 1960s, families were generally large. Having five or six children was not uncommon. Many families had more children. But with the advent of the pill and the virtual blessing which modernists gave to it by telling people to follow their conscience, Marriage beca became divorced from its essential purpose, which is the procreation and education of children. It is as if God gave us the faculties of reproduction solely for the purpose of pleasure. Now, women could use the pill and be promiscuous without the embarrassing problem of conception out of wedlock. This permitted them to put off marriage and seek careers normally reserved to men. When they did get married, they could stay on the pill indefinitely with the effect that their careers would not be interrupted. In the event that they wanted a child, they went off the pill and had the baby. Eventually, they would hand over the baby to a daycare center and go back to their careers. This is the normal way of life today. With this newly found freedom, in, in quotation marks, women began to desire to get out of their traditional roles of raising children in the home they began to see themselves as the social equals of men in the home. As if the home were not an ordered society with a government, but a place in which two separate governments lived side by side, the husband and the wife. This state of affairs naturally led to chaos, the very chaos which we witness today. It has led to divorce, and remarriage at incredible rates. It has led to disturbed youngsters who have absentee mothers and fathers. It has led to double income homes with few or no children in which the acquisition of money and goods is the supreme law. It has led to the now widespread practice of living together which repudiates the very notion and institution of marriage. Before 1960, to live together was considered a scandal. And it even had the term of being shacked up. You might recall that. Obviously a pejorative term. Now we hear that someone has a partner and they live together with their partners as if that's perfectly normal. Women's liberation, in quotation marks, as if they had been in a form of servitude, which they were not, has placed an intrinsic disorder in the home. 
for it is impossible that the home be a two-headed monster. It is clearly necessary that one person be in charge and that all the others obey. Every human society works this way. We don't have two presidents. We don't have two congresses. We don't have two supreme courts. Businesses do not have two CEOs. Armies do not have two supreme commanders. But the modern family, which is the most important of all societies, because it is the building block of society itself, now operates on the principle of two heads. And that is why families are destroyed today. One has only to watch contemporary media to understand what the 1960s has done to the family. The children are fresh, insolent, and dirty-minded. The wife, or husbandless mother, is brash, bossy, contemptuous, and disrespectful, and as always, dirty-minded and dirty-mouthed. She is in a skin-tight pair of pants and is wearing a top, which is as tight as could be, low in front and back, leaving nothing to the imagination. This is mom. Dad, if he is around, is usually a submissive idiot and, like everyone else, has filth on the brain. Because of moral relativism, the media has wasted no time in promoting the perversion of sodomitic marriages, of living together, of abortion, and many other sick, weird, and mortal departures from the natural law. Women on television are portrayed, and in the media in general, are portrayed as heroic if they act like men. So they are seen as tough and rugged. That's good. That's just like men. Do not women realize that what, that, what an insult that is to them? That the only way in which they are worth anything is if they act like a man? Where is the glory of their femininity? Do women not realize that what Hollywood and the 1960s have done to them is degrading? That they have to dress in such a manner as to be a constant sex object for a man? That their only worth is to show off something that will appeal to the basest attractions of men? something that we have in common with the animals. Look at the fashions of women before World War I. Dresses, or skirts to the ankles, long sleeves, high fronts, and high backs. Look at the pictures. Then look at women as they dressed after 1918, typically the 1920s. Skirts at or above the knees, sleazy dresses, low fronts, low backs, and tight clothing. The revolution of the 1960s destroyed women and with them the family. It destroyed our religion in every single place in which it had been founded and in which it flourished for centuries. It destroyed our children, both literally through abortion and birth control, <laughs> and morally through permissiveness, irreligion, moral relativism, and the destruction of the family. It destroyed men by perverting and undermining their roles in the home. 
It destroyed decency, modesty, and the sweetness in young girls and women and opened to them the world that once belonged to men's mistresses only. We must add to all of the above the pervasive evil of rock music and its satanic culture. Born in 1956 with Elvis Presley and given impetus by the Beatles in 1964, it filled the minds of young people not only with cacophony and impurity, but also with a cult of the satanic. We must also place in the mix the educational revolution in which the public schools were completely poisoned with false ideas, ruined, so that the children would go to school and learn things that would make a sailor blush, and many other ideas that, that perverted their minds. And it's far worse today. And there was also the idea that everyone had to go to college, as if it were high school. And in college they received the dose of the infection in lethal quantities. Nice young people would be sent off to the university only to come back as atheists, liberals, socialists, and advocates of free sex. And this happened even at so-called Catholic colleges and universities. Many young people lost their faith in the 60s because they were sent off to these places and they were ruined by the modernist clergy. What fueled this wild revolution against the family and decency was the unprecedented prosperity of the 1960s. Money flowed and greased all the gears of the churning revolution. So there were three revolutions, one of 1789 against the church and religion in general, then that of 1917 against even natural justice, the principle of private property <clears throat> in the political and social orders, and then that of 1960, which is the worst of all, against the structure, morality, and decency of the family through the enthronement in the family of irreligion, of socialistic egalitarianism, and the rejection of authority, the enthronement of women's liberation, of subjectivism, moral relativism, and sexual liberation. This is the average family today. And in the midst of all of this darkness, which I have just described, we turn our gaze today to the Holy Family. What a different place it is. Let us think about our Blessed Lady as she sweeps her kitchen in Nazareth. Not a single speck of these products of hell has infected her immaculate soul. She is a woman of perfect purity, of perfect modesty in dress and behavior, of perfect humility, of perfect submission to her husband. She understands her duty in life, the hardships of poverty, and rejoices in them since they are the will of God for her. She keeps her house, she cares for Jesus, she quietly does her work. That mothers imitate this, the mother of God, is very difficult today to merely be what I just described, since they must submit to a deep and at times very painful detoxification process. They have been in many cases through no fault of their own, influenced by these revolutions of which I speak, but most of all 
by that of the 1960s. Prayer is the key of all sanctification. If a mother fervently prays to the Mother of God, especially through the Holy Rosary, to be a good Catholic mother, she will receive necessarily the graces to be what she should be. And the more she is like Our Lady, the more her family will be like the Holy Family. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.